All right, looks like we're just a minute away, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll kick this off. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our second demo in a series of live APM demos we will be delivering over the next couple of months. Uh, my name is Amy Feldman, and I'm a Director of Product Marketing here at CA for Application Performance Management. I will be your moderator for today. So before I turn it over to our speaker, I'd like to first cover a few of our housekeeping items. All of our lines have been placed on mute. If you do have questions throughout today's presentation, you can submit them uh, through the chat window or through the Q&A window, which is located at the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. At the end of the call today, we will open the lines up for Q&A and address any of those questions uh, that either were submitted during the webcast or we'll even take some of uh, the live questions at that time. Uh, your questions are very important to us, and if we do run out of time to answer any of your questions live, we will follow up with those after today's presentation. So I'd like to introduce and welcome our speaker for today. Uh, today we have Paul Suholitz, who is one of our pre-sales engineers based out of Atlanta. He's one of our expert residents on application performance management, and we're very pleased to have him present today's live demo of APM. So without further delay, I will hand things over to Paul. Paul, go ahead. Hello. Hi, Amy. Uh, thanks, for everyone, for attending. This is Paul. I'm from Atlanta. Um, hope where you are, it's equally as beautiful as it is down here in the southeastern U.S. It's an absolutely fabulous day. Uh, today, we're going to spend a little time and introduce the current version of CAAPM, CAAPM version 10. Um, a lot of the colleagues of mine have been around since the days in which uh, Wiley, the, the predecessor, was acquired by CA nearly a decade ago. And we all share the enthusiasm. This very well may be the, the biggest or the most important release of CAAPM since that acquisition back in 04. So really eager to introduce it to you guys and kind of show you what we're up to over here at CAAPM. It's really an exciting time for us. Uh, I'll share with you, I'm going to be pretty merciful here. I only have a few slides to go through here, and we're going to spend the majority of our time in the live product itself, kind of giving you a sense of the interaction with the, uh, the solution. Um, just in the way of context, uh, we have the strategy of, of what we call the application economy, and fundamentally the essence of it is uh, our clients that, that don't even think they're in the software business are really now in the software business. You know, you can't go anywhere without seeing uh, the proliferation of, of mobile devices in particular. In fact, I read a recent survey where several thousand millennials were surveyed, and actually 75% of them said they would rather give up their sense of smell than allow someone to pry their precious mobile device from their hand. All right. So, so what other, uh, what, what, what more indication is there how important it is to have a, a, an excellent mobile or online experience? Uh, things like taxis with the Uber application. Uh, our new or our office uh, of the business unit is out in Santa Clara. Uh, the new stadium for the 49ers is there. And actually, if you go to a football game now uh, and you bring your mobile device, you can actually watch a replay of, of plays that have happened on the field right on your mobile device. Uh, so the idea is you can't go anywhere without your experiences being software experiences. And the challenge is that a lot of the applications that are supporting these were designed for user experiences that are totally different than the, the end user experience from a mobile device. Case in point, we work with a lot of financial institutions, and a lot of their back-end systems are optimized for a one-on-one -on -one interaction between a client and a teller. You know, so in those circumstances, they have planned or, or optimized their systems for, let's say, several hundred uh, uh, account balance queries every minute. When now, with a mobile device, they're being deluged or crushed with several thousands of that tens of thousands of account queries in a given second or several minutes. So the challenge is to identify where those shortcomings are in these systems that were otherwise optimal, optimized for more traditional interactions that have now been moved to the web and ultimately to handheld devices. So that's kind of the backdrop of what we're doing here with our APM technologies. 
So first I want to kind of take a survey across the marketplace. So what you're seeing on your screen now is the top three market share uh, owners of the APM market. And, and you may be familiar with some of these. On the far left is the, is the IBM solution. Uh, near and dear to our hearts is the one in the center, that's CAAPM. And on the far right is a technology called Dynatrace. And if I were to open the lines and basically ask you guys, you know, what do these things have in common? You may see things like, well, they, they, they don't have the most interesting GUIs. Uh, but if I gave you enough prompting, you'd fundamentally finally get to the point where you realize or said that, that these technologies are really, at their best, descriptive. Uh, they'll tell you what's going on in a, in a situation. They may identify circumstances, but they're really, even at their best, do little more than that. Now if I show you a, a set of three more uh, technologies here, and one of these is uh, one called New Relic, another one's one called App Dynamics, and one's called one called App Neta. But if I asked you a similar question there, you might say that they've got kind of more interesting visualizations. The one on the far right certainly has a kind of an interesting way to show data, but, but at their essence, we'll suggest to you that, that they fundamentally are still essentially just descriptive. That is, even at their best, all they're doing is identifying situations in your infrastructure, in your applications. Uh, they do still, they're, they're very transaction-centric. And then, most importantly, they still require expertise. You know, expertise not only in the application, uh, in the APM technology itself, but also in the applications that you intend to instrument and tend to model. You know, so we will suggest to you that, that that's a fundamental shortcom shortcoming of all APM technologies in the industry today. The challenge is, if, if, you, if you get descriptive, and get to an interesting size application, you'll get a visualization like this. And you have to be a mind reader uh, or a, a person of tremendous insight to derive some kind of powerful information out of something like this. Uh, now, if you look at a competing technology, this happened to be the, um, um, the AppDynamics solution, you can see it, it's still very descriptive. And I still would defy anyone from deriving some meaningful insights from something as cluttered as this. And the, the problem is it, it's only going to get worse, you know, because these technologies are getting more and more sophisticated as we start introducing things like microservices, uh, different kinds of containers. Heaven forbid you move this stuff to the cloud and have to instrument that. So the message here, the traditional APM technologies, irrespective of how compelling the cosmetics might be, simply will not scale to be consistent with the needs of our current uh, current customers in this evolving application economy as we've characterized it. So what's the challenge? The challenge is descriptive tools can be extremely powerful, but are generally used only by a few expert hands. And we tend to use the medical analogy of that these tools, in a lot of circumstances, are like a very, very sharp scalpel. And you put the scalpel in the hands of a trained expert, it can do very powerful things. However, if you put that same scalpel in someone's hands that are less expert, not only in the use of the scalpel, but in human anatomy, very unfortunate things can happen, obviously. So that's kind of the fundamental challenge with traditional APM technologies that we're, we're starting to address with APM 10 as the first step in the trajectory that dramatically changes the narrative around APM solutions. Um, so fundamentally, the idea is traditional technologies would require something like surgeons on ambulances. That is, uh, in order to get enough people uh, using the APM solutions today, they all would have to be trained to the level of surgeons. So in the context of APM, that means that in order to use traditional APM technologies as effectively as necessary to justify the investment it takes, you'd have to send these people to training in the APM solutions. And you'd also have to train them on the underpinnings of the technologies and the applications that they intend to instrument. And that simply doesn't scale in, in technologies or in, in industries that we're working with today. So what's the, what's the opportunity here? The opportunity is to move from something that's just descriptive to something that we're characterizing as prescriptive. So let me give you an example. Current technologies today will basically describe or identify things in the application or things in the infrastructure. They'll say, I see A and I see B. But they don't even go so far as to correlate, right? So they lack the ability to say that every time I see A, I typically see a B. So that's, that's going from identification to correlation. And then last but not least, they fall very short of going to causation, right? So, so none of the solutions that are out there today will identify, correlate, and presume causation, such as, oh, by the way, 
not only uh, do I see A and B, not only do I often see a B when I see an A, but I'm going to go so far as to say that A causes B. And therefore, I can roll back to what we call the patient zero and get to the, the root cause of a problem much more quickly. Well, it's that prescriptive evolution that is the fundamental basis of where we're intending to go with APM. Now, I'll share with you we're not there yet with APM version 10. But when I show you the demo here momentarily, you'll see that it's not, we're on a very uh, dramatic trajectory towards that prescriptive world where we'll be able to say that this caused this, and as a result, this happened, an application anomaly presented itself. So it's, as I said, it's a very uh, exciting time as we very quickly evolve from the traditional descriptive world, but something much more prescriptive. So how did we come to this, uh, this awareness, right? Were these just smart marketing people that sat around the table in a vacuum and thought the stuff up? Well, no, that's not the case. We invested a tremendous amount of money in understanding uh, exactly how customers uh, understand what's going on in their application world, right? So, so we basically, we hired a, an outside organization. Uh, they met not only with our customers, but customers using competing products. And they asked very general questions to a number of stakeholders in these organizations. General questions like, uh, what's a good day for you? And how do you know when there's a problem? And when there is a problem, you know, what do you do? Who do you reach out to? And a lot of the systems were not just, I we use my APM technology. There were things like, well, I call this guy, or I Google this, or I put sticky notes all over so when it happens again, I know about it, right? So they gave us some very general responses, some of which are directly related to kind of the traditional APM perspective, but some of them actually transcended that and talked a little bit about social engineering and things like that. So that's the basis or the fundamental springboard from which we started building APM 10 and we'll build subsequent versions as we move forward. Uh, the idea is uh, from those stakeholders, we distilled basically you know, these nine personas as we're calling them. Uh, you'll see down the left-hand side this idea of reactive, reactive improvement and continuous improvement. That basically says that you know, we kind of characterize the enterprises in which these people work. So at the top one, uh, if a company was purely reactive, that is, they just waited for a fire to happen and threw buckets of water on it, they typically really only had two important personas. First is the APM administrator, the one who worked with the APM tool, and then an application developer. It was, it was as simple as that, right? So they had some, some challenges there, and then the application developer was also responsible for doing everything but uh, administering the APM technology. Now, if you get a little better, you start introducing more of a support structure. And this persona that's very important to us is gentleman Pete Miller, level one support person. Uh, he actually is a person who isn't particularly trained in APM. He kind of picked this up as he went. Uh, he's got a number of different technologies he has to work with. And typically he only stays in his role for a number of years. He doesn't have the, the, the opportunity to build a large knowledge base when it comes to specific problems with specific applications. So in addition to Pete, We've got Ryan, who's a little more of a, a, a senior guy, and some other folks like that. And then obviously, if you go to the bottom, continuous improvement, that's the much more evolved environment where we have more level one support guys, productive support analysis, things like that. But what I want to underscore to you is that one of the main focuses of APM is empowering P, uh, uh, the persona Pete Miller, a level one support person, to get to the, uh, get to the point at which he can pass off an application problem to the right person the first time. I'll share with you that uh, I actually worked for a, a help desk system a number of years ago. I'm not sure if you guys know the BMC remedy system. But one of the statistics we used a lot when calling on customers were looking at how many times an issue was passed before it was moved to resolve status. And it wasn't uncommon in a lot of circumstances to see that ticket passed five, six, seven times before it was resolved. And as you can expect, it's a tremendous lack of productivity, not only in the fact that the issue isn't being addressed effectively, but perhaps equally as, as problematic is uh, you're, you're wasting the time of valuable resources at each of those turns that ultimately is not positioned or not equipped to resolve the problem. So the challenge is, you know, how do you empower someone like Pete to pass a ticket to the right person the first time so not only do you resolve the ticket as quickly as possible and restore service, and of course service is critical in the application economy, 
But furthermore, you're not wasting the time of these other uh, scarce resources as they struggle fruitlessly to work on a problem that's not even in the domain of expertise or domain of control, right? So that's what we're doing with this concept of the personas. Um, so we're, actually with, with APM 10, we also have this, this additional concept, we're calling it EPIC, right? So the idea is that APM technologists need to be easy, proactive, uh, in, intelligent, and collaborative. Now it's, it's, it's a fancy marketing uh, uh, phrase, epic, and uh, kudos to Amy and her marketing team on coming up with that, but, but it genuinely makes sense in that unless these solutions are in fact easier uh, and more proactive and have in, implicit intelligence in them and allow collaboration, we're never going to get kind of the kind of adoption across large enterprises that are deserving based upon the investment people make in these solutions, right? So let's focus our lens specifically on APM version 10 and the kinds of technologies we've included in the feature payload that we're very proud of, quite frankly. Uh, so the idea is that, that these are the three marquee capabilities, and I'm going to be showing you those momentarily in the demo, demo I'm going to do. Is the first one is this concept of the perspective based on object attributes. So I'm going to talk a little bit more of that in a subsequent slide. But the idea is to give you capability to look at, it, look at the world in a way that's consistent with, you, with the way you tend to view images and objects and things like that. The second is timeline, and the benefit being it allows and empowers people to drive to more faster resolution and therefore improving the uptime. And then this capability called differential analysis. You know, and the idea there is to provide a mechanism that automates the process through which you can identify anomalies in the application performance and things like that. So zeroing in, let's talk a little bit about perspectives. So I like to think of perspectives as looking for, you know, the similarities in the data. You know, answering questions like, when I see this outage, is that outage localized to a particular location? Is it just in the Los Angeles? Is it just on, on technologies or applications that are supported by the Los Angeles Data Center? Uh, is it just middleware based upon IBM technologies? Uh, is it just uh, everyone using a Firefox browser trying to run these kinds of transactions? So perspectives are very powerful to eliminate that messy view like we saw early on in the, in the presentation uh, and giving people a way to look at the same data through a different prism that allows them to, to have more informed decision support when it comes to triaging problems and things like that. The second one is the timeline view. And that's from my perspective, um, from my point of view, sorry, I didn't mean to use perspective again, but the idea is that I literally can go back in time and look for what we're characterizing as patient zero. You know, so we're extending that med medical analogy and zeroing back in and say, okay, well, I see a bunch of red on my screen. What was the first red? What was the first alert or threshold that was breached? And what were the series of events that caused rise to that outage? And I'm going to show you that in the demo, and hopefully you'll see the power of that because it really has been jaw-dropping to a lot of the customers I've been introduced to. On more than one occasion, I showed them that, and people have uttered a, a, a literal wow when they saw it. You know, So not to build it up too much, you're going to see it here momentarily, but that's kind of the idea behind timeline view. And the, the idea being, okay, we'll see all this in the live demo. And last but not least, differential analysis. So the idea here is that we've got some very sophisticated underpinnings for something that delivers an ability that, that at its essence is very simple. So I'm not sure if you guys have previously used technologies that try to set baselines automatically or set thresholds automatically for you. So in other words, I don't want to have to have the user go in and for every single customer interaction say that, okay, three seconds is good for this, but five seconds is good for that, and it's different on Monday afternoon and Friday morning. Uh, the idea is, and a lot of people have tried to do this in the past, is automatically set those thresholds and without manual intervention by the user. Now, now, when you've done that, traditionally, a couple of things have happened. The first of which is that they turn into spam engines. They start sending so many false positives out that they deluge a user with those false alarms, and the loser, at the most benign thing that happens, is they just simply start to ignore them. Now, worse than that, they sometimes go in and override those to an extreme degree. So I liken it to the fact that, you know, without intervention, it's kind of like a smoke alarm. And if the smoke alarm kept bugging you about, I see matches, 
I see matches, I see matches. You might be inclined to go in there and change that threshold. And when I've seen customer do that, they change it so high that the smoke alarm then notifies you that, hey, in one minute, your house is gonna finish burning to the ground. And I actually had to, I worked with a customer that had the misfortune of doing something similar to that with an older technology. And sure enough, they changed one of the automated thresholds, set it up so high, and set it to like a 99% saturation of a particular resource. And sure enough, they had tremendous problems associated with that. So the impetus behind differential analysis is put in the hands of our users an ability to have those thresholds automatically set, uh, but not have it produce so many false positives that people start to ignore it, but yet not doing it at the expense of introducing false negatives that can be cataclysmic in application environments, and things like that. So the big three capabilities, you know, perspectives, timeline, and differential analysis. And of course, there's a lot of other, what we call supporting features. You know, so we've added some new technologies. We've improved the mechanisms through which we can trace across different processes. Uh, we've dramatically improved the capability to see the client side. You know, so one thing we're not going to show today is we have a technology called mobile app analytics that literally give you from, from click or swipe all the way down to code level, every single interaction from a mobile device to one of your online properties. Uh, with version 10, we also have the capability for a typical web browser using a Java, JavaScript injection we're calling BRTM, Browser Response Time Monitor. But literally, all of these kind of capabilities round out the offering and constitute what we have in the feature payload of CAAPM version 10. So at this point, without further ado, I'm going to pop over and actually give you a sense of interacting with APM version 10 live here on my system. So let me quickly check my uh, text chat window here. Let's see, uh, okay, I don't see any questions yet. So I will go over here. So um, one of the first entry points uh, is probably what we're calling the uh, uh, the dashboard view. All right. So the idea is what would typically happen is you might have a threshold automatically set by that differential analysis or DA capability. Uh, it would then send an email with a hot link to Pete. Recall Pete's our support analyst. And Pete might click on that link and get directly linked right over to a view, right? So the idea here is, as I told you, we surveyed our users and saw what they did. And it turns out they told us one of the main things they did was create dashboards for different stakeholders that gave that at a glance understanding of kind of how things were doing in their environment. And what we saw was they spent an inordinate amount of time doing basically the same task repetitively, providing these views for all the different stakeholders that basically had the similar kind of information. So with this entry point being the dashboard view of CAAPM version 10, I can simply go in here and say, I just want a dashboard that shows me all of the application statuses for all the applications I've instrumented. And oh, by the way, I also want to know all the business transactions that are supported by those instrumented applications. And maybe last but not least, I want to know what are the locations associated with that, right? So I can very easily go in here and create these kind of visualizations without having to do any code whatsoever or scripting or any even drag and drop because it's simply pull downs to do those kind of things. Now the interesting thing is if I have stakeholders that have specific interests only in a particular portfolio or subset of applications, I can filter it very quickly. So I can go in here and say, oh, by the way, I don't want all of these applications. I only want the trading service and the order engine are the only ones that this particular stakeholder is interested in. And as you can see, it's kind of like a pivot table, you know, where, where a filter I set early on is then cascades through these other, other prisms, and then I get a more filtered view of the world, more consistent with a particular stakeholder's perspective and things like that. Now, when I show this to cu customers who have uh, worked with one of the more traditional versions of CAAPM, I often see a look of fear in their eyes because they have spent countless hours in a lot of circumstances in custom building a lot of dashboards. So that gives me a platform to tell you that, that we are, everything we do with CDA APM version 10 is a pull, it's not a push. So in other words, all of the traditional capabilities that our customers have been accustomed to, up to and including, but not limited to, dashboard generation via the more traditional means are still there. 
you know, the idea is, you know, we should make this compelling enough that people will migrate themselves to these newer capabilities. And I was working with a, a large customer, a customer of mine in Nashville a couple of weeks ago, and they said, yeah, they kind of conceded that, yes, for, for 80 to 85% of the dashboards that I've been building manually with great expense and effort, I can replace it by doing this. Right? So that's kind of the idea here, as, as, as born from experience we got from surveying those customers. Uh, we see that we can dramatically eliminate the amount of custom dashboards by putting this kind of capability in the hands of, of people in the know. So now if I, if I eliminate that filter and I go back to the, the, more, uh, uh, the larger view where I'm seeing everything, I actually can go in here and now if I am Pete, the, the level one support guy, I've got to get to the bottom of this. I see I've got kind of a widespread outage impacting a number of applications across a number of transactions that seem to be in a number of locations. So I'm going to switch to a bit more technical view we call the perspective view. Now let me share with you that the perspective view in typical APM technologies it's probably going to look something like this. And we kind of saw this early on in the presentation, right? So, so if I'm relying on a view like this, I really have no context whatsoever. I see a number of reds, but I don't know which of these reds was the causal red and which is the sympathetic alert that posts as well as the first one. So it really is a challenging view. And this is a very simple application as we're going to see momentarily. Just imagine uh, in the scale of a real enterprise with real applications, you know, how confusing a view would this would be, <clears throat> particularly someone like Pete, you know, who isn't trained in the applications, isn't trained in APM, he simply couldn't make heads or tails of something like this. So by contrast, let me kind of show you the perspective view of APM version 10. So I'll simply go over here, instead of my dashboard view, I'm going to pivot over and show you this perspective. So the idea is I've got a number of lenses through which I can look at the application. So case in point, I may be one who's interested more in kind of the, the functional underpinnings of the application. So in this particular view, which we call the type view, I can see the business transactions. I can see the servlet performance, the web services, the databases, the socket connections, things like that. So I get that kind of view of the same data I saw in this, you know, in this view here is now presented to me in a way that's much more consumable, much more interpretive for me, right? So I'm going to talk about a couple of these icons here now. So the icon on the right is basically telling me the alert status. So it's saying the denominator here of 20 tells me that I have 20 alerts configured on the business transactions, five of which are showing an error. I can get a sense of kind of how red is red. You know, this is a scale from one to four of these bars. And by the way, if we're fortunate enough, we may see an arrow up or down on the top of this one to four bar configuration. That kind of tells me whether things are getting better or worse and kind of the intensity of the problem. So things like, you know, how much over a threshold have I been and for how long has it been persisted? And now on the left, that's the indication of that thing we call differential analysis. So another differential analysis has gone out and looked and looked for anomalies in these metrics. It's saying that we've got a little bit or a moderate amount of instability in these business transactions. So in other words, some of them have departed from what I would consider normal, so they're worthy of keeping an eye on because it may get better or worse. But there's any number of other perspectives that are delivered with the technology out of the box, things like location, right? So looking at this, I can see things like there's the Los Angeles location, there's New York, there's Chicago. Uh, if I had been lucky enough, this outage may have been uh, limited or restricted to one particular location. In which case, it may make me think that, well, maybe there's a network outage in that location, or maybe there's, some, there's something specific to that location that's introducing this problem. Now, at this point, it is not, so there's something else going on here. Uh, a typical view is this end user and application view. That turns to be the one we're going to use throughout the majority of our demonstration here today. So if I click on that, you get a real sense of, you know, kind of how things are knitted together. I see all of these end user transactions out here, and I'll scan those up and down. Uh, and then I can actually in, in kind of go in here and I can expand the application components as well. So let me compress this back down. Let me recenter my view. And then if I expand the application components, I can get to the point where I literally can follow the red and see exactly what's going on. And I think you can see the path here that I've got end user transactions impacting these various application components 
all the way going back to this order engine component, right? So it, it gives me the ability to watch this, follow the ridge, go to the deepest ridge, and get a sense of what kind of the overlying problem is or what the deepest point of impact is. Now, I'll share with you that in a lot of circumstances, the customers I work with, a lot of whom have embraced kind of the ITIL-inspired service management. So in addition to doing problem management, that is getting to the root cause, one of their goals is to restore service as quickly as possible. And a lot of them aren't particularly sophisticated in doing that. You know, they actually look to see if they can restart something to restore service. And in a lot of circumstances, they want to know how are the JVMs mapped to this application. And if you look at my base perspectives at the top, you can see that I don't have that perspective, a JVM-centric perspective, delivered out of the box which is good because I want to use that as a vehicle through which I show how easy it is to build a custom perspective. And the one I want is I want to see how this is hosted by JVMs and whether I can, in fact, just restart the JVM and restore service. So the mechanism is, is actually quite easy. As you might expect, I just click on Add. I'm then presented with an option to build what we call a simple perspective. In this case, I want a multi-level perspective, which basically means I want to cluster by various attributes at various levels as I go through this. Now, the first thing I want to cluster on is the end user. So in other words, cluster all of the different kinds of transactions first. And then I want you to cluster by the hosts that are ultimately supporting those transactions. And then last but not least, I want you to cluster by the JVMs on those hosts that are supporting these applications. And the proxy for JVM is going to be agent name. So if you're familiar at all with APM technologies, it's customary to have a one-to-one -one mapping between agents and JVMs or CLRs or something like that. And for convenience, I can simply save this and call this the JVM view. All right, so now when I save it, it'll show up in my list of perspectives here, and it's been selected for me. And now you can see all of this data that was presented in this very busy representation here it's now distilled down to this. And you can see at its essence, I've got a bunch of end user transactions supported by a single host. And what do you know, as I suggested with you, regardless of how complicated this looks, it's one single JVM that's delivering all this capability, right? So if I go back to my, my scenario of I'm an incident problem management guy and I want to restore service, yes, I probably could, in fact, restart this JVM and restore service as quickly as possible, right? So the idea here is that, you know, you can use these perspectives not only to look for similarities in data structure, but also you can go in here and look for things like, well, what's the JVM hosting of this? And how might I go about restoring service as quickly as possible and therefore, you know, eliminate problems that my end user are experiencing, right? So that's kind of the power of the dashboard view, the perspective view, and a little bit about differential analysis. So now, last but not least, I want to drill into the timeline view. And I'll share with you that, that sometimes the timeline view is, is very powerful when used with multiple screens. Of course, I don't have multiple screens here. I'm, I'm on a, a WebEx. So I'm going to use multiple tabs to do that. So if I close this and I go back to my perspective of end user and application, you can see I've got that view there. I've expanded it a little bit to get kind of all the components down here in the bottom. Now, if I go to the timeline view, you can actually start to see something that's really, really powerful, right? So I'll call your attention to all of this at the top. I've got multiple swim lanes, the top being status, the middle one being topology change, and the bottom being attribute change, right? So now I can simply look across these swim lanes, and I can kind of see what's happening. Recall our, our discussion about identifying, correlating, and causation. So I, I clearly have identified an attribute change. I've identified a topology change, and then I've identified a couple of status changes, the second of which is this threshold breach on one of the components in my map. So I've identified very easily. Now I'll share with you that in APM version 10, we're actually still relying on the end user to do the second two of those things, but I think you can see with these swim lanes in the timeline, it makes the second, the second two correlation and causation much, much easier. Because I can look at this and say, well, wait a minute, these clearly seem to be correlated events because they all happened around the same time. And then the timing of them makes it pretty easy for me to presume causation as well, right? So I can say that this attribute change, which, by the way, if I opened my details panel over here, recall what I said about the sticky notes, 
Well, this is kind of our version of the sticky notes, where if I want additional details, I can go over here and see the specific alerts that were posted at a specific time and all that kind of thing. Uh, it gets a little busy sometime on a WebEx because it consumes a lot of my real estate. But what I want to do is I can actually scroll down here and show you that, that I do have this attribute, and the attribute it's talking about is this one called new release. So in other words, what this is telling me is that a little after 947, I had a new release dropped into production. Shortly after that, there was a topology change that presented itself. And I'm going to go so far as to say that this attribute change of new release caused this topology change. And then I'm going to go so far as to say this correlated circumstance of an event starting and a threshold breach was caused by this topology change, right? So we, as I said, in version 10.0, the one that's currently shipping, we're relying on the end user to visually correlate and manually presume causation. In subsequent releases, we're actually going to do that automatically. So a user will be presented with a story that says something like, I see an erosion of performance on the trade engine. It's impacting X thousand people from the following locations. Uh, it was, it's a result of a new release being dropped into the infrastructure at this time which ultimately caused the introduction of this as a topology change, and then saw alerts start to post. Now, the real interesting thing here is I can, I can actually slide this timeline back. And the mechanism I want to do that, I'm going to use my new um, tab here, which is similar to having a second monitor. Right? So if I go back there, and now I slide this back to before the topology change, you can see something really, really interesting. Right? So the idea here is that I've got the before the topology change, I've got the after the topology change, and if I toggle back and forth between those, you can very easily see and dramatically see the differences in that there's actually a new method that is introduced into the whole scenario that ultimately is the culprit here. Right? So I'll share with you that I actually presented this, uh, gosh, about 10 days ago to a major client of mine, and, and we had the great fortune of having the CIO in the room. And he stopped the presentation and, and basically stood up a little bit in his chair, and I, I started to wonder, well, what the heck's going on here, right? He says, no, wait a minute. He says, you're going to have a dramatic impact on my service management system. And I was a little confused. Uh, I said, so I'm, I'm sorry, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, it's, it's no small frustration to me that number, one of the top resolution codes in our service management system is can't reproduce problem. Now, we seemingly can't find a way to get to the, get to the bottom of these things in the absence of being able to have a test environment that mimics enough of production that I can reproduce problems. He says, what you're showing me here is something that's likely to reduce, if not eliminate, my need to reproduce problems because everything that's descriptive of a problem is captured right here. I can see the timeline. I can see the series of events that caused rise to the issue, and I do it without having to reproduce anything. So I think he, is, he really calls the essence of what we're doing here, that it's a fundamental change in the way people can use the technologies because we, we literally are zero, going back to what we're calling the patient zero. You can see that was, in fact, uh, this attribute change, which in this case is that new release, caused a change in the application itself that ultimately caused rise to a number of reds. And if I let the timeline run, you'd start to see the rest of these alerts start to propagate as these causal alerts started breaking other things in their food chain, if you will. So that's kind of what we're doing there. So now I will share with you that that's kind of the, the perspective of the L1 support person. So it empowers him to get all the way down to this kind of visibility. Now, if I go back to my perspectives view and check one of these problematic components, I'll share with you that kind of the cornerstone of CAAPM since its exception, gosh, at this point nearly 20 years ago, is that deep method level information you know, for deep dive analysis of these situations. So the idea here is, you know, when it just gets in there, when Pete passes this to someone more expert on the application, he can easily go over here to the more expert view, right? He'll open his details panel or his sticky notes, and he'll just slide down here, and he gets access with the ability to, to dive in here and actually see a number of things. Let me switch over to my other mode. He can actually go in here and show me that live expert mode, right? So he gets a number of these things. We happen to call them blame metrics. But the idea is he can go in there and it actually go so far as to get method level information about what's going on, right, in various perspectives of this. But the idea is that, you know, 
we've, we've married this deep dive technical capability consistent with an expert view with a view that's much more accommodating to a level one support person. That is something, someone who's neither expert in APM technologies in general, CAAPM in specific, or the applications he intends to instrument and gives them the ability to pass that to the right person the first time. So in 20 words or more, that is CAAPM version 10. As I say, it's, it's, we're very proud of this. It's, it's being heralded as, as many as very, a very important release for CAAPM, and hopefully will drive a lot more benefit, a lot more adoption in our clients that have invested time and treasure in instrumenting these critical applications that are powering them in the application economy. So that's what I've got prepared today. So um, we could uh, open the floor for questions, uh, see if there are any questions or thoughts or comments. Yes, uh, Brooke, if you'd like to uh, unmute the lines, that would be great. Uh, feel free at this point to ask any questions or if there are specific items with inside of the demo or perspectives or timelines that you would like to drill into and, and get a little bit of a better understanding, now is a great opportunity to ask those questions. This is called leaving the audience speechless. Uh, no, I'm sorry, was there a question? <laughs> uh, hi. Um we're we're in a we're currently running nine point five, mm -hmm. and we're having some real challenges funding up around adoption because it is just too complex, mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. the training for various application teams. Yeah. Um, if and this looks really great, so you know we need to move across to this as quickly as possible. Do we need to redeploy all the agents that we deploy to be able to get this functionality? Yes, so Team Center, uh, these, view, these visualizations you do not. Now, I could launch into an advertisement of why you want to upgrade the agents, right? Because, uh, you know, the smart instrumentation and, uh, and those yeah, kind of things. But, 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 yeah, to, to answer your question, though, we, uh, we, you don't. You can use uh, the new EM with these Team Center views with the older agents. That's a supported configuration. Does 9.7 give us that, or you know, if we if we want to go from if we need to get here, I mean, we're, we're looking at 9.7 at the moment. Will that give us some of this functionality and lead us through to 10, or or yeah. can we jump direct? Yeah. So my recommendation would go all the way to 10, and I'm going to go back to my slides really quickly here. So, uh, and I'm not sure what kind of what kind of issues you might have had or challenges uh, you faced, but this HTTP and REST correlation support. Uh, it will dramatically improve the mechanisms which you can get those cross-process traces without having to manually go in. And I'll share with you that the desire is we, to come we, up with We've had some challenges around SOAP insertion. So yes. it, it had a big impact on our applications, and then unfortunately yeah. that had a detrimental effect on the rollout. So uh, yes. we, we need to move yeah. away from SOAP and get to HTTP as quickly as possible, uh, yes. get that engagement and adoption moving again. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, so what you're seeing is 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 the beginning, right? This is the starting point, you know. And the first thing was to empower less technical users with Team Center, but in parallel, performance is dramatic improvements in the agent technology, you know, because people talk about you know not liking to have do multiple restarts to kind of fine tune agents, and we're asking very powerful questions like, why doesn't the agent self configure? Why doesn't the agent optimize its own overhead? Do things like that. So, so stay tuned because it's just the beginning of a very exciting evolution, not only of the client side but of the agent and server technologies as well. You know, I think I think you're in for some very encouraging things because people that that's one of the motivations is we've got to drive more saturation. That is, we've got to get more apps instrumented quickly and adoption. Let's get more people realizing value from the technology. Right. So we've got kind of this this two-pronged uh, approach. We're going to improve the ease with which you can instrument applications and improve the utility that a variety of stakeholders get from the, from the application itself by improving those visualizations on the, on the front end. Hope that answered your question. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any others today, or is everyone eager to get outside in the in the pretty weather, perhaps? Hey, Paul, could you just explain a little bit more about the dashboard? I know one question I get uh, frequently from customers is, you know, what is that? What are those the the red bars and the green bars and then the blue? What does that all mean? Could you explain? Sure, a bit absolutely. More about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. So, so um, let's see. Yep. So, so the things here on the right. Those are simply an indication of the alert status. And, and okay, we've got one that's showing an arrow here, right? So if I pick on this guy down here, we've got this interesting fraction that's three over 26. The 26, excuse me, suggests that there are in fact 26 alerts configured on the server components. I'm sorry, three of which are in alert condition now. And what we saw a minute ago was that we had basically a more moderate breach of these, and it was in fact going up. Uh, there's a bar here that's going to go from one to four. So kind of the, the the slang is this is how red is red. I mean, it's one thing to post a red, but it's one thing to tell you that one of these thresholds was breached. It's way over the threshold, and it's been going on for a long period of time, and it's getting worse. That's kind of the idea behind all of these symbols over here is to tell you not only that something has breached a threshold, but how bad it is and which way is it trending. Now on the right hand side, you know, we don't see a lot of activity here, but this is what's called the differential analysis perspective. Uh, so the idea here is that if I start to see instability in the metrics associated with one of these, this bar is going to start to grow, right? So this is that self-learning uh, auto thresholding capability that's looking for things to start to depart from what is, quote, normal, end quote, for these metrics. The benefit being is you don't have to painstakingly go through and say that, you know, on Mondays at 8 a.m., for people that are or doing an order entry from Firefox, I want a 300 millisecond uh, threshold, right? The idea is the differential analysis is going to automatically establish what is normal, and if I start to see departures from that, I'm going to see a blue bar start to grow over here. Obviously, the higher the bar, the more instability there is in those metrics, and the more attention I might want to pay to that kind of circumstance presenting itself, right? So those are the two kind of icons here, the right-hand one being the alert situation, and the left-hand side being kind of the how unstable is the, the situation. Now, obviously, they're related, right? In most circumstances, people are going to configure the differential analysis to automatically generate the alert conditions. But in some circumstances, people might want to do that, might not want to do that, and we've, we've broken out those capabilities, allowing people that kind of flexibility to tailor to meet their particular circumstances. So that's kind of what we're doing with those two icons. Um, sorry, just to, I mean, I noticed that you've got an amber there. Three out of 33 sounds relatively low. What, why wouldn't that be an amber state? Uh, I guess one of these three could be, sure, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and given my demo situation here, it's telling me that one of these three must be uh, quite far over the threshold or must have persisted for a long period of time, right? So that's kind of the idea here, right? So this, you know, th that's kind of the idea. But but your point, all of these are configurable to meet your specific needs and, and, and circumstances and things like that. So is another way to look at that, Paul, would be, is that like one is, you know, the severity of the issue and then differential analysis gives you that like intensity of the issue, right? So you've got, you know, your traditional alerts and your traditional thresholds and then differential analysis kind of gives you that different perspective of, well, you know, what's the intensity of it? Is it something that's trending more to be an issue or is it something that's trending less? of being an issue, not really something I should focus on. Potentially, although I probably would look at these arrows here to give me that in indication as well. I mean, it's pretty obvious here, if I've got this and the arrow was up, it suggests to me that, that the, the alert conditions are worsening, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of insights that need, can be derived from both of these representations. That really depends on a particular, um, particular application circumstance that you're instrumenting. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, our level one, level two groups are very much trained that if they see red, they kick off an escalation process. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, historically, our training has had to be quite in depth to the point that, that we are actually looking more of a possibly a DevOps and moving it away from level one, level two, and residing it totally within the application teams as they know their application. Um, yes. I'm trying to drag that back because I have a whole group of level one, level two guys that I'd like to be involved in this process. Um, so, you know, are we now are we now saying that the training is more focused on 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 identifying, you know, when is something a, a, a P1 against a P2 or maybe something minor that you just need to keep an eye on and not necessarily kick off a massive escalation process, getting lots of other people involved. Is, is that where we're, where potentially we're looking at focusing on now for this? I yeah, like this actually, we, I think this is excellent. Yeah, we actually have, I'll, I'll share with you, and you, you may not have seen it yet, but we have kind of a, what we're calling the next gen demo, which is our concept car. You know, and, and if you haven't seen it, I, I encourage you to reach out to your uh, your local priest. Are you in the UK by any chance? Or, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, well, yes, imagine yes, how yes, I yes, imagine yes, how yes, I picked yes. that up. I know it's either Alabama or the UK. <laughs> I guess right. <laughs> <Okay. But> anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, that's just one of my gifts. You know, it's nothing I can teach. That's the problem. But yeah, so so we have this thing called the next gen demo that shows you the concept car. Now it's not it's not going to be in your CA dealership in the next model year or something like that. But we have this idea of time to critical. So kind of the idea here, and this is maybe the first step in that direction, is to tell people that, you know, you've got a problem, and it is a problem worthy of investigation, worthy of resolution, but you've got some time before it absolutely melts down. That's kind of this concept of time to critical. And, and there again, hearkening back to ITIL, is this something that's going to go super critical really quickly? I have no choice but to use a workaround, or can I more thoughtfully address this and invest a few minutes to look for the root cause, so I can you know compress the time till I can till I can put in an actual resolution as opposed to a workaround, something like that. But but you're absolutely right. That's kind of our idea is to start giving you that nuanced perspective that that leads up to this time to critical view, where you can figure out is this something I've got to just restart JVMs and be done with it and just worry about the root cause later, or can I more thoughtfully address it? and do something more elegant than just starting to restart things and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah and just to add on to that, Paul, um, but it's really taking that, you know, the APM tools are very descriptive, right? They're very difficult to understand. It requires an expert to decipher and figure out where the application issue is coming from. And as a result, as you mentioned, you find that most of your experts then are involved in solving every single problem. And so the approach that we're taking is that, we want to be able to have more of a prescriptive approach to an application performance management tool. We want to be able to have, you know, views and perspectives and the information in a way that makes sense for your peeps of the world, which are your level ones, so that they can triage application issues earlier on in the in the process, not involve an expert every single time, but then also give your experts the views that they need to be able to, you know, diagnose the problem down to a deeper level. Right. I say, I mean, at the moment we're spending the majority of our time creating dashboards for, for individual groups that then change their mind about something else, and so it comes back to us again. <laughs> and so, you know, we're actually constantly creating dashboards rather than rolling the tool out, which is what, which is what our objective is. So, you know, the, if there's a way that we can quickly get these created and and, and adapt them so they meet, you know, let's say a level one team or a level two team. Um, but I really, for me, I'm really trying to hand the tool off. We, we want to get it in. We want to get it up and running, get our standard dashboard created, and then hand it out to the various people and, and basically get them to use it, utilize the tool, go and look at what things might benefit you, and, and just get that momentum moving so that they take the initiative and start doing it. So so it needs to be quite driven, but it needs to be in a, in a, in a simple way that, that entices people to, to play to an all intensive purpose and try and get, maximize the value out of the tool. And, and, and unfortunately, with the 9.5 version, you know, we've, we've had it now for three years, and, and um, although we are trying to get it rolled out, the adoption piece is still a great challenge for us. 
So, um, so I'm yeah, looking for the next three the, years to really make some progress here. Yeah, you're you're describing the exact, exact impetus behind a lot of the modifications and, and and evolutions we have here. Say we've got to improve saturation, that is the number of applications that are instrumented, and we've got to improve adoption, right? Because if we don't get the adoption, then then people aren't realizing the value from the investment they've made in the technology. So that's that's exactly what we're going for to address the the challenge and frankly the opportunity you guys face because it's an opportunity if you get more people using it you'll derive more value and good things will flow from there. So so yeah, so this is this is step one in that evolution, you know. This is the, the impetus behind uh version ten, the start of that trajectory driving for that epic, easier capability. Yeah, and we well, recognize we just need to get there quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well yeah, well, trust me. Trust me, trust me, you know, we all are eagerly anticipating, you know, and we're we're beating on Santa Clara uh to uh to accelerate and they're they're doing a, a, a tremendous job. You know, we've accelerated the release schedule uh and, and haven't done have done so while we improved product quality. Which seems to be uh sure. almost a paradox, but it it's worked. You know, we've you know, I'll share with you your you're you're a relatively long time user. We had a number of the the Wiley guys who have dispersed throughout CA and throughout the industry have come back to CA. You know, so a lot of them are carrying the banner now that we're Wiley again, right? So, so it, it's an exciting time now, and it's only going to get a lot more interesting over the next several releases as we accelerate along that that epic strategy. I mean, one thing that we have come across is uh, we've, we've we've hit a number of bugs with nine five. That's had a uh, an impact on, on on what we're trying to do. You know, are, are you confident that with version ten, I mean, it's all new, it's all singing, it's all dancing. Um, are you confident that what you're actually putting out there is is stable, um, and that from yeah, you know, the appropriate testing has been done on the actual product itself to make sure it's really solid? Because again, yeah. when we push it out, be high expectations for the tool. Sure, yeah, no, absolutely, and and obviously, you know. Uh, first, we want to be uh, like Hippocrates. First, do no harm, right? So it's our encouragement, obviously, and you guys would do this anyway. Is to is to start in a lower environment, a pre-production environment. But but one thing I'll share with you is 10.0 has been out since the end of June, so we're, we're relatively close to the 10.1 release. You know, the incremental build on 10.0, and and mm -hmm. and you know that's typically people that express the view that just you you just expressed. Wait for that dot one release, and uh, we're we're very close to that dot one dot one release. Now I haven't heard of any particular issues with dot zero that have caused the dot one release. Uh, it's more of a feature pack than a bug fix. But you know, classically, if there were any of those things that were in the dot zero release, uh, they're addressed in the dot one release. That I say I don't I don't have, nor can I tell you definitively when that date is, but it's quote pretty close end quote. And just uh, are, are there are there additional capabilities in ten one over ten zero? Do you know? There are most particularly one of the ones that's very powerful is the ability to uh, in uh, problem, prog programmatically input attributes, right? So let's say maybe you want to inherit attributes from a CMDB or something like that. You know, there's a programmatic interface to do that in ten dot one uh, that isn't in the ten dot zero release. So some of those kind of things. And we'll have – we can schedule some time with you um, through your pre-sales person to go through a roadmap discussion. This is more of a public forum, so we can't really get oh, into sorry. a lot of – Oh, sorry. I got a little carried away. No, that's fine, absolutely. I appreciate that. I, I just – I only had a call – a long call with uh, with RCA representative only yesterday. So um, so I was keen to see the, uh, the, the V10 in, in operation. So – um, I've been pleased with, with what I – and certainly that point in time, um, that is one of the things that comes up to me very, very frequently. So the, the ability to be able to track back um, it, it is a definite uh, – a big benefit, a big benefit. Well, good. Very good. Other questions, comments? We're just about at our stopping time.
Hey, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Paul. This is Chaitan. Uh, hey, folks. This is Chaitan from Product Management. So we have the beta build for APM 10.1 available. So if you would like to have a go at it, have the early access to it, you could drop me an email to that. Maybe the email could be provided at the end of the session. Uh, if you're a member of the beta community, CA APM beta community, you would get uh, information on this uh, beta build as well. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Okay. If there's no further questions, um, I guess we will close our session today with our uh, our thanks and our appreciation for your participation today and uh, for the existing customers uh, for your continuing investment and support of uh, TAAPM. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much. Enjoy Thanks, your Paul. day. Great job. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for attending. Thanks. Bye-bye.